Josefina, are you aware that Dee's asked that all this art be destroyed? Would it have changed anything? Oh, Jesus. Hold on, Josefina. Stella. Redora. Oh, my God. Velvet Buzzsaw sits in a really strange place between good old horror gorefest and satire, never quite fully delivering on either, and as a result, and has a strong tendency to polarise audiences. In the very first few moments of the film, Jake Gyllenhaal's Morph Vanderwalt exclaims that an artwork called Herberman is just a repetition of the artist's previous work. It's an iteration, no originality, no courage, my opinion. Given that Morph is such an influential critic, these words doom this piece to be locked away in storage without a sale. But if we read this line more broadly, it taps into the very DNA of Velvet Buzzsaw, Dan Gilroy's second feature, which reuses the key cast, key themes, and sociopathic tendencies from his debut hit Nightcrawler, albeit with a wholly different effect that, admittedly, doesn't have the same tenacity or thematic resonance as its predecessor. The admiration I had for your work has completely evaporated. The film gives Nightcrawler's themes a new lick of paint, replacing the dark streets, fast cars, and TV news industry that leeches off quick moments of tragedy with sheet gallery interiors and a range of characters squeezing every penny out of the life's work of artists. As with Nightcrawler, there's only one thing that seemingly matters in the world of Velvet Buzzsaw, the bottom line, and how many zeros it includes. Artists who work long and hard on their art are simply fodder for our sociopathic cast to eat up and spit out as they please, only ever paying attention when hot currency is involved. In other words, in their world, art is not art. Art is a paycheck. In fact, this is so true that these art managers often don't even know art when they see it. This is remarkable. It's not art. Hey guys, what's happening? Niat here with Film Comics Explained, and today we'll be exploring Dan Gilroy's Velvet Buzzsaw. Critique is so limiting and emotionally draining. Always wanted to do something long form. The heart of Velvet Buzzsaw's narrative is, like many slashes and gore fests, intriguingly simple. His death, the disappearance, Everything that is now happening, it's all connected to his art. He left explicit instructions that it all be destroyed. What are you saying? Stop selling these! In short, as the film begins, the art market appears to be stagnating. Artists like John Malkovich's peers and the street artist Damrish are moving between management with no intention of being cash cows, while all the managers and galleries are in fierce competition with each other. Fortunately for them, a lowly assistant, Josefina, stumbles on a literal treasure trove when an old man, literal Dees, dies in her apartment building, leaving behind hundreds of works that capture the hearts of everyone who lays eyes on them. Tell me who the artist is. What the fuck is wrong with you? This shit talks to me. Unbeknownst to everyone, Dees had mixed his human blood and tissue into his artwork and imbued them with his twisted spirit. He used it to create the reddish blacks in the shadows. There's in every piece we studied. As Josephina's boss Rodora blackmails her into giving her a cut of the sales, the two flog off some of the paintings for extortionate prices, hiding the rest away to make those on show even more valuable. Unfortunately for them, the paintings are, for want of a better word, cursed by the troubled artist, resulting in the death of the gallery assistant Bryson, followed by, well, pretty much everyone else. There's a lot to unpack, but to better understand the film's narrative and themes, it's important that we explore the characters that are killed by the curse. Gillen Hall's morph is a brutal art critic who knows the power of his word. Nothing is ever good enough for you. That's my job, I'm selective. He starts to film by dooming the work Hobo Man and continues using his powers to sink other pieces. A bad review is better than sinking into the great glut of anonymity. Was that a joke? Not that I'm aware of. One particularly callous, dishonest review sends an artist over the edge, leading to him driving drunk and getting into a coma-inducing car crash. I heard he was crushed. By the car? Your review. When the cursed paintings are found, Morph signs up for exclusive rights to a book and a number of the pieces to be handed over. Josephina starts at the other end of the spectrum, working as a receptionist for gallery owner Redora. 
At a certain point, Redora explains that she was grooming her to inherit the gallery. But instead of power, prestige, and respect, Josefina inherits Redora's money-grabbing, vacant, soulless persona. It's not for three hours. It'll take me that long to get ready. It's just a fundraiser. There's going to be pictures. Perfectly brought to life by actress Renee Rosser, Redora's arc mirrors that of Josefina's. In her youth, before she effectively sold out, the gallery owner was in a punk group known as Velvet Buzzsaw, a history that now only lives in the form of her tattoo. We don't sell durable goods, we peddle perception, thin as a bubble. Call your buyer, sell as much deeds as you can before he posts something. Prepared to compromise on her morals for the right price, she doesn't hesitate to take custody of Deesa's work. How's it? It's done done. A young entrepreneur who believes that anyone or anything can be bought given the right price, John Dondon plucks the artist Pierce away from Rodora's gallery and begins to fund his work. But unfortunately for him, Pierce is at a creative dead end after giving up alcohol and becoming disillusioned by the parasitic art world around him. Nevertheless, John tries to buy up more and more, snatching up two of Deesa's paintings and calling up a private investigator to discover the history of the artist in the hope of upping their prices. Gretchen also manages to get her hands on some of the cursed art, alongside an Anish Kapoor-esque installation called Sphere. She uses Deesa's art as leverage to push this work into the gallery, in turn pushing up the prices of both Deesa's art and her own collection. And finally, we have Bryson, who's tasked with transporting the cursed pieces to storage, but can't resist himself and takes the opportunity to get rich quick. Despite some of them eventually trying to absolve themselves, they all learn that hell hath no fury like art scorn, with the vengeful artworks coming up with artistic ways of sending them to their final destination. Coco, on the other hand, along with the thousands of people who see the D's exhibit, survives. Young and optimistic, she remains uncorrupted by all that surrounds her. And although she witnesses three deaths, because she never once profits from the cursed pieces, she's left untouched. The deaths that we see are a potent allegory against corruption in the art world, where artworks essentially lose their meaning and go from being works of creative genius to commodities. In this way, each death can be summed up almost as a fail-safe measure to prevent Deesa's work from falling into the category of commodities. But if we look closer, and even closelier, we can see a broader collection of immoralities here. Bryson becomes a thief, Gretchen and Rodora blackmail others, John wants nothing but more money, Josefina is corrupted through and through, and Morph misuses his power and destroys careers. At the height of her corruption, Josefina yells at Damrish. What's the point of art if nobody sees it? While many might respond to this question saying the key to art is communicating thoughts, feelings and ideas, Dan Gilroy adamantly disposes of this. Instead, Gilroy suggests that it's the creation of the thing, the artwork, that has the most intrinsic value. In the context of the film, this ideology wins out too. Those corrupted by wanting to display or interact with the art purely for profit end up dying hard, while those who simply appreciate art for what it is survive. This is also evident in the only two artists, well, live ones that we see in the film, Damrish and Pierce. Damrish has just risen to prominence as an artist from living in relative poverty, meaning that the ideas of selling out and being corrupted are still very much at the forefront of his mind. And despite hanging around the likes of Rodora and Josefina, he decides to cut ties with the commercial art world after seeing one of the cursed paintings. Piers' narrative is even more explicit. We meet him as an incredibly renowned artist, but one who feels hollow in the world of commercial art, looking for some way to tap into creative consciousness without keeping it tied to commerce. Although he stagnates in his workshops for days on end, Rodora, now his ex-manager, tells him to disconnect from all of this and create something that is only for him. And as the film's credits roll, we see exactly that, with Piers drawing lines in the sand and creating a form of ephemeral art that will never be seen, but brings him great joy and satisfaction in its creation. While these two key themes are very potent, the fact that money corrupts and art should be for the artist, they're certainly nothing new, and even worse, they're wholly idyllic. Of course, Piers can spend time drawing lines in the sand because he's a commercially successful artist that doesn't have to worry about his next paycheck. Similarly, Damrish can simply recede, as his art is now undoubtedly valuable. In other words, while Giroy's themes are powerful, they're presented in a very short-sighted way. Another issue with the film is its overuse of every negative art world stereotype and cliché. 
Of course, it's very much the point for us to disdain most of the characters we come across, apart from perhaps Coco, Damrish, and Piers. But while this disdain leads to a bunch of the deaths feeling gloriously well deserved, they serve to flatten the themes, leaving no room to explore the necessity for the works of artists to be worth something in order for them to make ends meet. After all, to put it rather bluntly, if Gilroy, the cast and the crew made no living from Velvet Buzzsaw, would they have still made the film? Probably not. But this draws us right back to the statement that opened this video, and Velvet Buzzsaw itself. So it's an iteration. No originality. No courage. My opinion. A phrase which may sit in the realm of self-satire, exclaiming how the film is so hyper-aware of its own place as a successor to the financially successful Nightcrawler, while simultaneously sitting in stark contrast to the morals it presents. But perhaps it is a phrase which is just simply painfully ironic. 